Right. Um, uh, Mark was going to present this paper, and he unfortunately uh, uh, can't be here, and he sends his regards and uh, wishes that he were here, but, but he's not. So I will fill in for him. Uh, this is an ongoing project uh, that we've had uh, for quite some time, studying patents on technology. The idea is to study technology as an open-ended process. Um, uh, and, and perhaps an example of open-ended evolution, though I think we have to put a little asterisk by the term evolution because normally you think of uh, evolution having a um, heredity uh, mechanism uh, going from one time step to the next and exactly how heredity works for technology um, isn't clear and uh, we've done a bunch of analysis of that problem and that's really uh, kind of a, uh, another longer story. Um, for the time being we're going to just um, try and address the empirical question of whether or not we see um, open-ended evolution from the data that we get um, in the patent record. And, and so we're using the patents as a proxy. The technology itself is kind of um, a great example of, of uh, uh, intuitively what we mean by open-endedness. It's, um, it's fully embodied, right? So Josh should be help, happy with that. And, uh, um, but it does also have uh, um, a participation, a heavy participation, uh, on the part of real people, because they're the ones who are making the technology, they're consuming the technology, and motivating the technology. Um, but I think uh, I'm uh, studying this with the same spirit that Ken Stanley was articulating in his talk, that, that even when it, with uh, systems that are, uh, involve human beings, uh, it's still useful to try and understand what they can tell us about open-endedness. And so that's the spirit that I'm going forward here. So we're going to look for open-ended evolution uh, empirically using two different kinds of observational mechanisms. One is the classification, um, uh, the classification that's given by the U.S. Patent uh, Office. And uh, uh, you can just look at how many of uh, different classes of patents uh, um, uh, uh, occur over time. And that's something like uh, uh, it's largely fixed. From time to time, they do create new classes, but the cl new classes are just added on to the old classes. And so overall, the structure is pretty fixed. And then uh, uh, we're going to contrast with that with a, um, uh, a more dynamic form of classification that we've uh, invented, and I, I'll tell you about it. So for each of these classifications, um, the, the, the a priori classification of the US Patent Office, so I'm going to call pigeonholes. Um, uh, for, and for each of these, we're going to uh, run evolutionary uh, activity statistics, and um, I'm so glad that Alistair gave such a, a great uh, uh, explanation of them, so I won't have to spend any time uh, on what they are, uh, and uh, we'll see what kind of activity waves come from the data, and basically each new activity wave is like an innovation in the system, and it's not the innovation of a particular new technology or a particular patent, um, but it's, it's for this whole category of patents. Um, so the patents we're talking about as a proxy for technology, this is a, a typical patent, and the data that we're taking from the patent is not the whole patent, uh, but just the, um, the uh, title and the abstract. And uh, the, re the rest we're just throwing away. Um, so this is what the uh, classes look like. Uh, and 
you can see they're rather detailed. Uh, there's hundreds of them. There's various levels of classes. We chose a uh, level where there were um, uh, classes and subclasses. And this is the, I'm just giving you a, a, an example of how detailed these classes actually get. Um, they uh, are actually quite detailed. What is a head covering, for example? And what's the difference between a crown and a hat? And, and um, uh, so when we look at the statistics for the, this, this is what it looks like. And uh, um, you can see that, that um, uh, it's graphed from the, the old patents are the blue ones and the new, uh, pat newer patents, I mean the newer classes are the red ones. And you can see that uh, uh, we've got ongoing open-endedness apparently um, from the statistics in the sense that these waves keep on going and moreover they keep on getting uh, generated. New ones keep on getting generated. Except, wait a second, um, uh, around about 1995 this data uh, has no more new waves. Well, this is somewhat problematic since um, if we think intuitively, since 1995 we do have new techno technology developments, and so we would expect um, new waves to be popping up, but we don't see them. What's going on? Well, our um, explanation for what's going on is that, that uh, the lack of waves are, are really false negatives and uh, come from the fact that the uh, U.S. Patent Office is not being very prompt about figuring out when new technology is really coming up and when a new category um, is, ought to be created for the new technology. And so, so this is kind of belies a certain need for a more responsive uh, classification. Are you saying they didn't make new categories after 95? Or just that there weren't a flow of patents into those new categories? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I believe it is they didn't make, they haven't been making new categories. And uh, I don't know exactly what the timing is. Um, and I haven't looked at the fine grain categories, but I do know for the um, uh, coarser grain categories, of which there were 36, uh, those 36 um, uh, were last updated about um, 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 around 95, 95, 97. So, this uh, is an explanation of, a, of our alternative to um, uh, the pigeonholes, um, and 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 what we're doing is is uh, taking the the titles and abstracts and performing a certain kind of analysis called uh, topic modeling, um, uh, whereby we take these. Um, this data, this language data, and embed it in a high dimensional space. And we use this um, um, program called Dr. Beck. And the idea of Dr. Beck is that, that nearby points in the space correspond to semantically nearby, um, uh, nearby patents. And it works pretty well. Uh, the details of what we did was we, we cut up time into a, a hundred chunks, uh, a hundred time frames of about 50,000 patents each. And uh, that means that their calendar time is very different because there's been more and more patents being produced more recently. Um, uh, and then for each time chunk, we use a k-means clustering to create categories. We're thinking that uh, we can think of, of, of each time frame's clusters as actually, uh, if you take the centroid of that cluster of patents um, in the technology space, this embedding space, um, uh, then that's, that, uh, that, that category is represented by a point in the space. The space 
is created by this embedding, and uh, uh, we call it technology space, and the dimension that we're using is a metaparameter of the algorithm, and we're using a, a dimension of 300, which is kind of a standard dimension for many uh, uh, Doktovec problems. So, um, just to give you a sense of uh, uh, whether or not these classes make any intuitive sense, here's just a list of some of the keywords. You can see all of the keywords with, with um, underbars are uh, n-grams formed by uh, combining uh, adjacent keywords. And, uh, and you can see, basically, um, they do kind of make sense. And uh, I've, I've chosen three uh, classes to show you as an example that actually do make a fair amount of sense. Um, as you can imagine, uh, the process is noisy, and there are some uh, classes that, when you list out the keywords, they don't really make sense, or they look like, well, it's a mix of two different clusters, and so some maybe... Uh, the right number is not 25 clusters, but maybe the right number is 40 clusters and uh, to get a good list of, lists of keywords. And we played around with that a lot. We're reporting on 25 for, for the moment. So these cluster groups evolve. Um, well, let's see. Did I really say what a cluster group is? Basically, once we form the clusters, then the way we classify patents is actually to take the, the, the clusters and form these groups of clusters which are all close to each other in the 300-dimensional space. And so our classes correspond to actually groups of clusters. Okay? So these cluster groups um, evolve in a way that the... Um, pigeonholes did, do not evolve. So each time scale, we redo the clustering and uh, come up with a, a new set of clusters. And then you can ask, well, is a given cluster at a given time frame close to any of the other ones or not? And uh, often the answer is yes, in which case it gets lumped into the same cluster group Sometimes the answer is no, in which case you've got an innovation event. So this is a, a kind of a pragmatic solution to the emergence problem. And I've tried to illustrate what I mean schematically here. Basically, we have technology going as this kind of evolving system producing a constant stream of innovations. And uh, the way we're proposing to deal with that generically is to actually have an observational system that's running in that's evolving in parallel with the uh, um, with the system you're observing and so the evolution of the um, observations is is necessary to um, solve the emergence problem which is that you don't know what to look for um, uh, before it's been innovated. So this is a picture of, of these cluster groups. Um, uh, the blue ones start early and the red ones start late, later. Um, no, I guess that's not the, the case. The, the, the red blue is, the, the blue ones are the most massive cluster groups and the red ones are the um, uh, lightest weight cluster groups. Um, and so we've listed them all out and, and uh, each group is corresponding to a class. Uh, I'm listing out a couple of, of uh, um, of classes here that we've identified. Um, these are our, our classes we've identified um, by looking at the keywords, and this is a, our human um, interpretation of these keyword lists. And uh, 
this, this is a, um, an example of a couple of uh, uh, cluster groups that seems to, seem to have gone extinct. Um, this data, by the way, is lasting from 76 to 2014, broken up into these 100 chunks. So we do various things with the data. Um, like, for example, we project it using this T-SNE 2D projection. Um, and you can kind of see uh, the structure. This is uh, um, a picture where the, the <laughs> earlier points are black going to the more recent points, which are white. Um, and you can see that the structure is very suggestive that uh, uh, you should be able to predict where a given um, categorization is headed in the space. Um, this is uh, uh, the same projection colored by cluster group. <clears throat> so here are the um, activity waves that I promised uh, um, for the cluster groups. And I've labeled a couple of, um, of uh, examples of, of particular clusters here. Uh, a particularly interesting one is number 60 over here, which is a cluster that started really recently in that uh, period where there were no new categories uh, from the, the um, uh, USPTO. And it turns out to be a security and encryption cluster. Um, so, uh, this last graph that I'm going to show you is simply a, a graph of, of all of the, the distances within a clus each cluster group. Um, and we've uh, uh, tried to label uh, uh, this, these um, uh, distance distributions um, along uh, uh, temporally. And, and uh, when, when we have a, a new cluster group appear, uh, the distance between the lower whisker and this um, uh, threshold down here, which is the threshold for uh, closeness, uh, gives you an indication of how new it is, in the sense of how far is it from any cluster that's existing already. And so this uh, um, most recent one is an example of one that was very uh, different, and so it was a strong innovation in the sense that it was very different semantically from um, all the other clusters. It's not the only one. You can see there are a few of them here that have, uh, 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 that uh, when they first formed, they were quite different. So that's uh, basically uh, the end. Um, we've looked at, at all of this data, the, the the USPTO data lasts back to 170 years, and, uh, and we have 39 years of the uh, clustering data. Um, and uh, we've tried to uh, implement this pragmatic solution to the, to the emergence problem by evolving our observations. And, uh, and we think it's pretty clear that according to either one of these uh, um, analyses, the um, the uh, U.S. patents or technology as represented by the patents are in fact an example of open-endedness and uh, I think the same uh, the same um, techniques can be used in principle for other empirical studies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Noah. Questions? Rookie. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I can speak, speak after. Thank you. So this is very interesting. And uh, oh, thank you. so the patent also comes with the citation network data. So are you using citation? For example, you, you could trace back the one particular category citing the, the many other categories so that you could actually infer which technological areas are inspiring to create a new offspring, so to speak. Yeah. And, uh, and actually, when I... Um, um, alluded uh, at the beginning of the talk to this issue of whether or not uh, there was a hereditary process going on. Well, 
to answer that question, you use the citation data. Um, but when you use the citation data, you've got to figure out how you want to define traits. And you could use as traits um, um, the US Patent Office categories. You could also use as traits our uh, cluster group categories. Um, and to tell you the truth, we did a bunch of research um, uh, trying to tease out what the extent to which um, uh, heredit hereditary processes were going on using the USPTO uh, case. And then we started to understand how it would be better if we created our own uh, observations. And so this is kind of a tangential sidetrack to that original work. Um, but that, that original work is still going on, and, and what we're going to do ultimately is to carry these uh, classes back to that work to use them as traits to um, answer this question about uh, hereditary, the heritability. Um, and that study uh, makes extensive use of the, the a citation network to define a parent-child relationship. That would be very interesting to see, yeah. yeah. Okay, there's one question there. Kind of maybe uh, just a technical slash detailed question. Um, the TSNA projections that you had, was that using the, the doc2 vec vectors, or was it after you've already clustered them into groups or into categories? Uh, well, so each... Um, each um, cluster centroid is a point in this 300 dimensional space. And each of those were then projected down. So this is uh, uh, 25 cluster centroids for each of, of 100 time steps. So this is the 2,500 um, centroid points. Okay. Projected from 300D, given by the Doctovec uh, algorithm, down to 2D, given by the TCE projection. Okay, uh, Alisa, do you want to get set up and Steam has a question? Yeah, really interesting work, uh, uh, Norman. So, so but I have a, a little bit tangential uh, question. Um, I've been wondering. What, 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 what is going on? Because if you look at the patent data, uh, certainly the rate has slowed down compared to what it was in the, uh, in the late 1900s. And, 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 and it doesn't seem to fit with our intuition about uh, patents, how many patents have been filed. If you look at the, the, exp the exponent by which it's growing, it's not as fast today as it was uh, 100 years ago. Is that really true? I'm not sure that's true. Uh, it's the reason that I'm questioning that is that if you look at the actual calendar time for our our 50,000 patent time chunks, it's generally been getting shorter and shorter, which kind of no, but it's still exponential. But the 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 exponent is uh, is is lower now than it was. Over, but then, but anyways, I, that's something I don't understand. Well, let's, let's look at the data together and, and uh, to resolve this. And I don't have an answer for why that would be. Um. Okay, thank you, Norman.